Well, good morning. morning. Welcome to all of you. Come find a place, your place in this place as we get ready to worship. I was wobbling around at the back a little bit late getting some hugs and hellos from people we haven't seen or family members. Father's Day greetings. Always good. We're glad you're here today. And may the Lord bless richly your life as you open your heart to Him, responding to His spirited work through His Word today. Let us pray. Father, it's a privilege again to come into this room together. And the joy in our heart is because of what You've done for us, what You continue to do in our lives, and for the uh, realization that we are Yours that we are among the redeemed, and that the blood of the Lamb of God, that precious Lamb, washes away our sin and makes it possible for us in Jesus Christ our Lord to come into your presence, our Father and our God. Have your way with us today. Work in us your will. Make your word alive to us in such a way that we can embrace it and spend some time in the days ahead talking about it, entering into it, studying it, feeding on it, working change in our life. Bless every family here today, every individual life. Fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit. Send us out today ready to be your witnesses as we leave this place. Thank you for loving us today. We pray for fathers today in this room who have children. Many of them have grandchildren, great-grandchildren even. We're thankful for family. We're thankful for your faithfulness to men who will dare serve you and live for you in their homes, in their workplaces. We pray today that you'll help us to do what you have called us to do in this culture of ours, and that is to represent your kingdom, to live to the glory of God, to lift up Jesus, to live according to your word. Thank you for your rich blessing, for your always present reality in our lives, for the love of Jesus and the cross. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone agreeing simply said, Amen. Amen. Now we're going to stand and worship the Lord our God, singing one of the hymns we've been singing a lot of years around here, Vast the Immensity, Mirror of Majesty. What a wonderful song. Three holies for our triune God. Amen. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is from the book of Hebrews, chapter 12. I'm going to be reading verses 18 through 29. For you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them. For they could not endure the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See that you do not refuse him who is speaking, For if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. At that time his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken, that is, things that have been made, in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. 
Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. May God add his blessing to the reading and the hearing of his word. David, the body of Christ broken for us. Amen. Body of Christ broken for us. Body of our Lord broken for us, Phil. Receive. Blood of Jesus poured out for us. Blood of Jesus poured out. I was trying to remember the first time I had this meal. Being in church as a little bitty guy, um, our churches back in those days didn't allow us just to come forward just because we were part of the family as a little kid. We had to have an experience with the Lord. Had to become truly His through new birth. And we were we were born again, some of us, pretty early. Now, I was an old man of 12, but um, my son, Daryl, was five when he came asking me to baptize him. And I don't remember all the other ages. We had a lot of the kids that were young, and, um, but legitimate. God could change a heart. Regardless of whether the child is baptized or not, the parent has a responsibility to train them up to a point to where they can understand what has been done who he is, what has happened. And they can then either look back at their baptism and say, that was what that was, and I'm, I identify with that. Or they can be baptized, having been born again. I like that. And, but the baptism does not save us. This bread is just bread and just grape juice. I started to say wine. It's not quite that. It's close. And when we take it, eat and drink. It's, we have to realize who died for us. This is a death scene when we come to the table. It's a death scene. Jesus died for you. Now we can die, but it wouldn't do us any good to give up our own lives because we couldn't save ourselves. We were lost. We were marred by sin. Jesus didn't have any sin. He died for sinners as one without sin, a man without sin. God in flesh dying for sinners like us. When I remember it, and it's often, I say thank you, Lord, once again for the cross, the empty tomb. Thank you once again for the new life we have in Jesus, having been identified with you, that we're living right now, anticipating one of these days' glorification. If you're his, this table's for you to come. Eat and drink. If you're not his, I'd really like to encourage you. To think about where you are in your life. And in this troubled world, how desperately you need to know a certainty. And that one certainty that we all want to know. Necessity. A certainty that must be there. Born again. Have identified with the living God and, and turned from your sin to trust him as your savior. Amen. Jesus died for you. And when you repent, turn from, let go, get rid of by turning from your sin to him. Saying, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. He hears the heart, he initiates the work, and he's ready to go to work in you. And if you need some help, there are a lot of folks here that can help you. Or if you can come today, you can come after a while when we give you a chance to hear the gospel. And we'll pray with you here. I love this table. Because it represents to me a, a redeemer that I did not deserve. And it makes everything we do as believers in the world so significant. Because the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. To everyone who believes. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you again. 
of the privilege of worship. For the joy of worshiping in a community of believers to whom we belong and who belong to us in Christ Jesus, we're family today. Brothers and sisters in the Lord. And I thank you for that, and I thank you for your work in our lives. I thank you for the assurance in our heart. And I pray that you'd work in each of us so that those of us who know you will come receiving this meal. And those of us who do not know you will begin to think, consider, and turn from sin to Christ. Have your way with us, Lord. Your church in your presence. Bless us that we might be a blessing this week. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. We're going to form two rows right down the middle here. And you're going to tear a piece of bread out of the loaf, broken body, dip it in the fruit of the vine, the shed blood, eating and drinking the body and blood of the Lord. We who are born again are sustained by him in life. Newness of life is what we have to live in. So come church, the meal is prepared and uh, these brothers are ready to serve you as you come. We're going to uh, go to the Lord in prayer together this time. Taking our request, well a handful of our requests, thankful for God at work and all of you who are needing his provision. And uh, at the top of my list today, I had Charlie and Joan and Ron and Jody, and they're both, they're all here. So that's a good thing. That doesn't mean we're going to quit praying for you. It just means we're glad to have you among the people of God today. And I assure you, um, those of you who've thought about this a lot, when we gather together in Jesus' name, and we come to worship he who is the king of glory, the Lord of everything. He's here. And when we worship him, we sing praises to him or we're standing silently in prayer or we're praying or we're preaching or we're hearing or whatever it is in a service that is a call to worship. He is hearing us and he is working among us and we are receiving his touch, his lift, his presence. Anything he wants to do can be done those moments. He is not limited. Um, he has the power to transform your life, to transform your body, to do whatever needs to be done to make you well. Amen. One of these days we're going to all be well. Amen. And that's going to be glorious. Uh, we'll be with him, like him, and uh, without any more pain or sickness or death. Thank God for that. We're going to pray and take our request to the Lord. You remain seated with me as we do that. Father, I want to thank you again for the privilege of offering to you our hearts and our lives and being able to say we believe, Lord, that you are able to do anything that you have determined to do. Anything that you do will bring you glory. We submit to you and we thank you for your work in our lives, for your Holy Spirit working in us, drawing us near to you, shaping us, making the Word alive to us, changing us, healing us. And I'm going to thank you, Lord, that you are building your church right here in Montgomery County and so many places your people are gathered together right now. And we're thankful that in every gathering place, there you are. That's the beauty of this present God of ours, that you are everywhere present, omnipresent. And yet when you are with your people, it's as if we and you are all that's here. Remind us that that's not true, that we're actually being lifted up and joining the worship of all those voices from around the world who lift their hearts in praise. And thank you for your saving grace, your healing power, your guidance, and your provision. And we thank you, Lord, 
for that as well right now. Fathers, we pray today, we pray for your church all around the globe. We're thankful that you continue to build the church even in the hardest places for Christians to be. We're thankful that you're watching over and using your people, keeping them all the way to the end of the journey. And you're doing the same with your church here in the United States, and you're doing the same with your church around the world. You're doing the same with your church right here in this very part of the world, working your will in our lives and through our lives, building your kingdom, preparing us for the glory to come. And we thank you for all of that. Today, I pray, Lord, for particular churches, congregations around us, because we recognize we're part of them and they're part of us. Where there are born-again believers, there is the body of Christ. And so today we pray for First Baptist Church Conroe, lifting that congregation, asking you to continue your work in and through your people in that place, the body of Christ alive. Thank you for the anointing upon the Word of God as it is preached there today, as it is heard and believed and acted upon. We pray today as well for Living Branch Church west of Conroe. We lift them up to you and Pray that you'll continue to bless their lives and their service to you, their ministry, the proclamation of the Word, the living of the Word, and all the things that are going on in the context of that worshiping community. Your presence, your anointing makes the difference. And we pray for Kingdom Harvest, Church of God in Christ, lifting a congregation, Lord, to you and praying let your anointing rest upon those who serve today. Let the anointing upon the preacher be evident let the gospel be preached clearly and let it be heard and believed fully. Thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness to your church, all of us who gather right now in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. We pray for our nation. We pray, Lord, that you will work in this nation your will, that you'll be merciful to us so that we can progress and move forward to an understanding of our role, particularly us, who are born again and in the church, we want to fulfill our purpose for being. We pray for the leadership of the nation. We pray, Lord, for people who are constantly going about the work that they do and are beginning to have to become aware that many places in our nation and other nations is a dangerous place, that there's anything at any given time that might happen. We've seen it again this week. And Lord, as we lift up the leadership of the country. We lift up President Trump. We ask you, Lord, to work your will and all of those who govern so that we might truly always remember and continue to come to the reality that you and you alone can make us what you want us to be. We started out, Lord, with an understanding. We had an accountability to a righteous God. And I pray, Lord, that you'll always remind us that we have that accountability now, that as a nation in freedom, we must acknowledge and continue to acknowledge your great power and your majesty and your presence and holiness. We thank you for that. Fathers, we pray today. We thank you for what you're doing in Charlie and what you're doing in Joan. Our prayer for them, Lord, is that they'll have your touch, your health, your wholeness, your life. And you'll bless their union even as they journey now in a hard place. Bless them today. Let your Holy Spirit be felt, sensed. Let your Spirit work your will in their lives. Ron and Jody, we continue to pray for them and lift them up. We're looking forward to seeing your handiwork, seeing your marvelous provision, the miracle that's needed in lives. And Teresa, we lift up to you, Lord, thankful that your arms are around her every step of the way, thankful that you're walking with her and speaking to her and guiding her along. And I know it's hard. It's been tedious and hard. But let her know your touch right now. She knows we're praying. Let her know your touch right where she is. And we pray also today, Lord, for Billy, who fell again, and we just lift her up to you and pray that somehow there will be a way for her to get about a little bit without falling, that you'll keep her, that you'll protect her, that you'll watch over her, and give her the desires of her heart. She always enjoys being at worship, always enjoys being represented in the church as a part of it. So have your way, Lord, in that. Touch her. 
We pray for our sister Mary McKnight, lifting her up to you. Praying, and Lord, today she's pretty sick today, I understand. And we just lift her up to you today, and she sees a doctor tomorrow. We just pray that you'll guide her. They'll find what needs to be found, and man's look at things like that, so that she can find an overcoming, clear healing from your hand. We're thankful, Lord, for that. Lord, I want to lift up today my friend. For 30 some years, Roy Carraway is slowly moving toward home. And I pray for him because he has such an assurance such a hunger for the Word, and he can't read it now. And he's still walking, but not, he's not going to keep his driver's license this year. So things are changing, and I pray for him today. I pray you'd encourage him. I pray you'd keep him as his weight continues to plummet, his breathing gets more difficult. I pray, Lord, that you'd be there with him, holding him close, and that in the final analysis of things, we will hear him say, God has been so good to me. I give him praise because that's what he'll do. And I pray, Lord, that you'll keep him now and that you'll continue to work in all of those whose names are represented in our, on our prayer list this week. There are some that just need lifting up and encouraging and some that just need a miracle, that's all. And we pray that as we uh, look to you in prayer this week, you'll hear our cry and work in the lives of those we pray for. Thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness to us today. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Father's Day is every day almost, isn't it? If you're raising children, Father's Day is every day. If your children are raised up, you get to pray every day for them, that's for sure. But it does get a little easier when they're grown. Uh, believe it or not, most of you know that. We're an older group here. And the, uh, the reality is, uh, as we get older, we get older. And things change, don't they? And we, we really can't do much about that. We do the best we can to live and maintain our health. Things happen, though, that are not always, in fact, not most of the time in our control as we get up in years. So my prayer for, as it is Roy and various others that, are, that we know and are praying for who are up in years, we're praying, Lord, give them a great and glorious homecoming. Let their attitude be sweet and good and blessed at the end. And that's what we're praying for you. Thank God that we can do that too. Amen. I want you to open your Bibles to the 12th chapter of Hebrews. And what I've been doing, I've been kind of chomping along, those of you who've been listening to the sermons in recent. Of course, I haven't preached but a couple of times since I didn't preach for four weeks, so I've, you haven't been overloaded. But I've been working my way to a spot that will turn us loose on kind of a journey through Hebrews. So hopefully um, that's going to turn and head off that direction. I'm, I I'm going to do what I do when I read a novel. If I'm not sure of it, I'll read the last part of it. <laughs> Somebody said, you shouldn't do it. It ruins the book. Oh, no, it sets you up. You've got to see how they got there. So it doesn't really matter for me where I start. Now, if it's one that has been recommended and they haven't told me anything and I know it's going to be a really good one, I'll try to be patient. Sometimes it buries me in a place or two and I go on to the end anyway and it helps me get through the hole. Most of you won't read novels like that because you say it ruins the story. And it probably does, but uh, I do it anyway, just every once in a while along the way. But this book, this book that we're going to be looking at is a pretty special book in the New Testament. And uh, Hebrews leaves us with a lot of questions when you start trying to figure out who wrote, uh, who wrote to or who was written to. And uh, the date when the, when the letter was written, there are so many variations on the theme when you start looking at the scholars and uh, the people who give us understanding of the Bible. There's a lot of different things at the beginning of this book. 
And they just, you know, he doesn't get a lot of help about who's there or whatever. I've always felt, and I still think I, I hold to this, I think it's written to Hebrew Christians. It makes sense that it would be written to Hebrew Christians because the label on it is to the Hebrews, actually. The whole title is to the Hebrews. Now, the best commentators say that that was added <clears throat> sometime later by somebody. Um, just putting it to the Hebrews. There's a lot of information about what goes on in the old covenant structure and then the presentation of the better. The old covenant, now the new covenant uh, in Christ Jesus. And there's a lot in, about, in this book about, about Christ, about Jesus. Who he is, his sufficiency. Centrality of the book basically brings us to a Christology a study of who Jesus is. And um, I think it's a preaching thing. Now, you're not going to find this in the Hebrews text you have. But when you read this, you'll know it's not a letter, not in the common form of a letter. Paul wrote letters. And I always thought Paul wrote Hebrews. Anybody else ever think that? That's what we were told way back before we got mixed up with the scholars. And they give us reasons for it not being Paul, and it makes sense. So I can see where they'd be looking for another person. Apollos would be a good choice because Apollos was well-educated and very sharp. And this has been called the best Greek in the New Testament, the book of Hebrews. The best Greek as far as the use of language in any of it that's written in the New Testament. That's a pretty high uh, thing. So you might say Apollos. Uh, somebody suggested Barnabas, and they had a good argument about it. Barnabas was a good man, remember? Among the early believers, a good man. And uh, had a generous heart and had capabilities and love. So some thought it was him. Others thought it was Clement of Rome. Clement of Rome wrote quite a few things. It's in the old father's material. You can still read Clement's stuff. And he's a, he's a good writer. He understood the gospel. Silvanus was another. You want me to give you five or six more? That's probably enough. There's just a bunch. And uh, I hate to say it this way, but not one woman among them, ladies. I mean, I don't know why, but if you go back to this period of time, you know why. This was much um, a patriarchal type structure. You know, be, and it was probably men doing this writing at the time. There were women writers. Women whose names are known in, in the history of church, particularly things around the sides of it. So it's not an impossible situation. So we enter the text unsure of a lot of things. Now you hang on to chapter 12. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work in chapter 1 or 2 first, then I'll get to chapter 12 and read my text. So hold on. Let me cover this part. Um, if we have the question who wrote it, we're going to say we don't know. If we have the question, who were the recipients, we're going to say we're not exactly sure. If we're going to ask, what is the date of the writing, we're going to say somewhere between 60 A.D. and 100 A.D. Wow, that's a big gap, isn't it? The best ones I've found among guys that I'm familiar with in biblical interpretation is about 68 or so, the latter half of the first century A.D., somewhere in there, in the 60s, maybe the 70s. And uh, that'll be good enough. So we enter the text without a lot of clear understanding about those things. And they're always there. When you study a book of the Bible and the commentaries, you'll always find that they deal with these beginning points and try to figure out who wrote it, who received it, when was it written, what are the main themes, those kinds of things. Now here you will agree with me on, there are a lot of things to learn about the text by dealing with the text. You think that's possible? There's a lot to learn about the book of Hebrews by going into and through the book of Hebrews. You begin to get a picture of the pieces, the things that are revealed. Look at all those angels. Yeah, but a greater than angels is here. The sun is greater than the angels. Oh man, Moses, what about Moses? Yeah, but... We got a we got man who's greater than Moses. 
greater than Moses. And it goes right on through the book like that. And we get right back into the worship of the community in chapter 12. And I think it's significant. I, I, I love starting there because it puts us in the worship position before we go back and work on the rest of the book. And I'm going to promise you that I'm going to try to make them short, like 45 minutes. <laughs> I know that's not short, but it's shorter than normal, maybe 40. The last two sermons I've preached, I've preached in about 35 minutes. So if we can do that and add 10 minutes, we'll be just right. <laughs> what I do think, though, this is me, I do not think that it, it is written in the form of a letter. And I like the idea. I, I found a commentary or two that said, it's really written as a sermon. Well, it's an awful long sermon, isn't it? I mean, you got 13 chapters, and it's written as one sermon. But it bears all the marks, these commentators say, of early Christian sermon, a homily of the sort that was probably preached in a first Christian congregations somewhere down there. Now, I looked up, I know what a homily is, I thought. So I looked up homily. You familiar with homily? Okay. I thought, you know, a homily is you just kind of roll through the text, opening it up, boop -a -doop -a -doop -a showing you what's there. Homily, piece by piece. We went to a church when we were in Point Roberts, going to school in Vancouver, and I wanted to go to this church. Grace and I both wanted to be able to live on Point Roberts, which was isolated from the U.S. mainland, but belonged to the U.S. as a part of Washington State. So we drove 23 miles out of Washington State, around through Canada, dropped back across the border into Washington State, way west of the main body. And it was two and a half square miles, sort of, and it had water on three sides and a Canadian border on the other. 49th parallel right there runs all the way across up top of the United States. That's where it was. Way out on the west end of the uh, United States of America. And when we got in there, we, uh, we'd rented a house. We moved in, and we said, there's one Lutheran church, and we want to go to it. I think it would be great to go to it, because this church sat facing south on the edge of Point Roberts. That is, on the south side. There was a road running in front of it, a street. And then the little frame church, beautiful, white, stood up high. You stood on the porch, and you saw all the Puget Sound. You looked over all the mountains to the west and over the water to the islands down south towards Seattle. I said, I think I can learn here. This is going to be great. Great. First time we went there for a service, and we went there a couple of times trying our best. The first time we went there for a service, the homily was six or seven minutes long. I said, we're going to get the sermon in a minute. No, that was it. Now, that was, I should have I been real smart and say, oh, that's good. Just six or eight minutes and I'm home. Have lunch. Sit down by the beach or something. Just have a great time. No, that wasn't quite enough. But I thought a homily is real short. This couldn't be a homily. Well, maybe it's a bunch of homilies. But let's consider this book. Let's consider it a sermon the way it's set up, and see if we can determine that as we work through it, okay? We're not answering now. We'll answer it somewhere down the line. A sermon that is rabbinical in nature, kind of how the rabbis taught, and that would be certainly a pattern that would be found by Hebrew Christians, wouldn't it? They'd bring along what they knew and teach it that way. Christian in content, because the letter's written to those who are in Christ, and Heroic in length. Long. So it had to be studied in piecemeal. Now this letter could be written in a gathered small group of Christians or a church. It could be read to them in one setting. You think so? You just read it to them? I read all of Revelation on a Sunday morning service one time in West Texas. 
Every chapter, every word. And it took me an hour and ten minutes. And we went through the whole thing. And I'm going to promise you, I, I wanted to see if God would show up in a way that others had told me they'd been in services. And I wanted this book to sink in. So as I read it and I got toward the end, it just built in the realm of spirit and life. I just kept reading, but it was up. It was climbing. The Holy Spirit was there so real. By the time we got to the end, we were shouting through. Finished. Hallelujah. He was so present. You say, Pastor, that's not the thing we're after. I was after it. I, I wanted to know that the significance of this book of Revelation was true when it came to God seeing it as significant and putting it in the text and making it possible to help people who were going through hard times and all of that to get a glimpse of the throne room and a realization that one of these days the, the one on the white horse is going to come and call you out and gather you up and take you home and deal with the enemy finally, completely and totally. Putting him in that final lake of fire. I'm talking about the dragon now, the devil. Not just the Antichrist and his helper. They go in there before. But at the end, when you ride it to the top, you have just seen the glorious God bring glorious reality for the human race. We who are in Christ Jesus. It was an amazing service. I have not been able to repeat it. I have not tried to read Revelation through again in one in a service. That time it was the Holy Spirit. I didn't want it to be my time next. But it was true. He was there. Working in our lives in a very special way. We're going to call the writer the preacher. Or we might just say he. Is that okay? <laughs> he the preacher. The Greek language, as I mentioned, is a marvel. And he appears, this writer, he, appears to be quite well-educated, probably a well-educated Jewish Christian with a broad training in, in Hellenistic thought. That's probably who it was. And there are a few other shards of evidence in the text that give us some revelation of who the preacher is. This preacher knows a man named Timothy. And my question always then is, I wonder if it's the same Timothy that was a helper to Paul. Could it be? Yeah, it's probable. Probably wasn't, but it's probable. And this Timothy is mentioned. I'll just, so you know it's true, I'll go back here and give you the location. Uh, the 13th chapter, last chapter, verse 23 um, he said at verse 22, I appeal to you, brothers, bear with my words of exhortations, for I have written to you briefly. You should know that our brother Timothy has been released, with whom I shall see you if he comes soon. Oh, released. We always think about being in jail when you get released in the first century church. Paul understood it. Timothy's name, if, if he is the same Timothy then it makes sense that he would be a part of that evangelizing, evangelizing crew that was responsible to the Apostle Paul in the early days of church building. Somebody who went along preaching with him. He also sends this sermon, we're calling it that, to a congregation he knows. Let me give you a little more of that. 19th verse, same chapter, 13. On the 23rd, which one do I want? 13, 19? Uh, yeah, I urge you, he said, pray for us, for you are sure that we have a clear conscience, desiring an act to act honorably in all things. And then he says, I urge you the more earnestly to do this in order that I may be restored to you the sooner. That's the writer, that's the preacher writing to the church the Hebrew Christians, and he's saying, he's, uh, I'm, I'm, I urge you to more earnestly to do this in order that I may be restored to you sooner. So he knows them, and he's away from them, and he wants to be again with them. 
That would be our writer. That would be the one who's doing the writing right here. And the last thing I want to say about the preacher at this beginning point is this. He's not preaching into a vacuum. He knows who he's speaking to. And he is being certainly made aware of what's going on in the congregation. And I think he's addressing real, and we're going to see it in the Scripture, real and urgent pastoral problems, some of which seem astonishingly, astonishingly contemporary. That is, they are, have application for us today. Here's the problem with the congregation in a summary statement. They're exhausted. They're just beat. We're talking first century church now. It was hard. Here is a congregation, though we don't have a lot of information about it, whose members, whose believers who are members are worn out. They're weary. The language that we get in chapter 12, beginning at verse 12 in this letter, is therefore lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet. Tired. Struggling. There are other things that point us in that direction. What are they tired of? Let me ask this. I mean, don't answer it, just listen. You think we could say of Christ Church on League Line Road, we're tired. Let me give you some things that might suggest how to understand whether or not we're tired of the same things they were tired of. Are we tired of reading the Bible? No, I see a lot of good yeses. Are we tired of worship? Are we tired of learning the truth based on His beginning that study in our own hearts, journey? Are we tired of being opposed, murmured against? Are we tired of the spiritual struggle? Because if you live for Jesus in any culture, with this revelation of new covenant truth, it was going to bring opposition. Tired of trying to keep praying. Tired of being sick. Tired of all the death around, the losses. Think about it. People can get worn out in the context of so many things demanding from us our energy as we live in this world. And we're encouraged to lift our drooping hands and strengthen our weak knees and strive for peace with all men, is what he says up there following what I read in chapter, in, in verse 12. Strive for peace with all men, strive for holiness, see that everyone attains the gospel, see that no root of bitterness springs up. Be aware of the false teachers. There's a lot to get worn out by. A lot to watch out for. Make sure of. And oh, the biggest of all, attendance is down in the local church. Now, that's the only place I know of where we get a, a report on a church having lost attendance in the Scriptures. They did, of course, different ones there. But here it is. Let me just read it to you so you'll have it for reference. Let me read a few verses ahead of it, too. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. See, we're not letting go of anybody. We're encouraging, helping, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some. Some what? Some they know as believers among them who are not there. 
Not neglecting to meet together as the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day. And I understand this day drawing near things should be a motive for us, shouldn't it? To get in on what God is doing. Be involved in it. Be in it. Trust Him for strength to be in it. Don't lose confidence. For He has not changed. Still at work. Now the threat of this congregation, I think, that we're looking at right here is not that they're charging off in the wrong direction. False truth. They don't have enough energy to charge off in any direction. And of course, there's always times when people do charge off, as we know. But the threat here is that they're worn down, worn out. And uh, the danger is that they drop their end of the rope and just drift off. Tired. Too much going on. False teachers and everything. I don't know how to discern the difference. I love what this writer, preacher, servant of God did looking at this congregation. He didn't, as he looked at their spiritual weariness, which um, he's bold enough and brash enough to do what he does. But he thought, here's what he does. He thought the study, the beholding of Jesus Christ, his person and his work is what we need to focus on above everything else. And we need to preach it and preach it and preach it and preach it until every aspect of that revelation as to his value to us and his abundant supply of life becomes an assurance to us. He doesn't appear to get too excited about anything other than Jesus and getting the message out. I used to believe that. I still believe that. I used to believe that you could preach the gospel in all aspects of the person and life of Christ and all that goes around it and send it out to hit people's minds and hearts by the Holy Spirit's work. And it would change them that they would respond to it, be changed, be transformed, be fed, be stirred, be blessed, be encouraged, be strengthened, and would be driven to a hunger for the Word of God who reveals the truth about Jesus, who He is and what He does. Now we probably, if this preacher did it like some of us would do it now, the first thing we'd do is try to develop a little better small group materials, keep people in the small groups. Or we'd uh, get some conflict management help for people who weren't happy with things. Or we'd reorganize the mission and outreach structure so that it would be easier. Everybody can get involved without too much cost. Or we'd have a snappy worship service. And that would win people. Snappy worship services are okay from time to time. Developing good groups are good. We've done some of those. But the life-changing gospel is what transforms a heart and a life. And the steady preaching of the Word of God will make us what we are to become in Christ Jesus. Preaching and Christ. Shattered old way in the face of the new way. New covenant life in Jesus. He preaches to the congregation in complex theological terms. That's why when we look at this book, we're going to see a little different language than we see in most of the other New Testament books. He preaches in complex theological terms about the nature and the meaning of Jesus, the person and work of the Lord. That's what's in here. I still laugh. I still kind of get humor in me a little bit when I remember people saying, man, pastor, you're too intellectual. Give me a break. I'm a country farmer boy. 
What you do after a while is you start picking up the words in Scripture. You start looking at words that are true. And look then at the theology that is shaped from it because it is the study of Jesus and the study of the gospel that we're doing in order to preach that gospel clearly so people might know it. These words are not difficult if you determine not to make them difficult when you first hear them. For a lot of people, righteousness is too hard. It's not too hard. So here is a man who said, let's, let's look at who Jesus is, and starts giving us high, high priest talk and better high priest and all the things that goes on. It's going to be a wonderful book to study. This preacher doesn't float around on the surface where the desires of people clutter around the latest fads. Sometime or another, we have to stop that because we're losing the depth that we need to be the body of Christ in America and say something. I want the Lord to come down some Sunday, but I'm not sure I want the Lord to come down some Sunday in any different way He comes now. How are you going to stand in front of a holy God? I want, to, I want Jesus to come down, Jesus meek and mild, and come and, wait a minute, whoa. Remember I mentioned Revelation a while ago? When you look at Jesus in Revelation, this is after the work is done, after the saving is done, after the church is birthed, the promise of all that's coming. And he looks like someone to be afraid of to me. Eyes burning like fire. Where's Jesus meek and mild? That's him. Same one. When we get to the mountains in chapter 12, you're familiar with the mountains that are there. Sinai is one where the law was given. And Zion is the other. The mount where Zion was. And who is the God who sits on Sinai? Same God, isn't he? Who's the God who sits on Zion? Same God. So even though we're looking at two mountains, we've got to remember there's only one God. So when we go to Mount Zion and everybody gets a chance to stand before the holy law and realize that they are guilty before a holy God. The beauty is He's provided a Redeemer in Christ Jesus who is ready to come to your rescue when you figure out you're a sinner and you can't save yourself. Here's what I like. Now since the gospel has been at work and the life has been given and the church is working and growing and building and people are getting a right relationship with God, some sinner comes and, and we introduce them to Jesus with an understanding all your sins, all your breaking of the law, he paid for. Somebody said, I want to go, I want to know what the problem is. Jesus says, come with me. I'll walk you to the mountain. The one that you didn't come to as recorded here in, in the New Testament. I want to walk you to the mountain and I want you to see that you can't touch it. You can't get near it. You've got to stay away from it. It's going to kill you. Except that I died for you. I paid a price for your sin. And this is not your mountain now. Come on. And we walk back across to the other mountain, same reality, only now we're standing at Zion with the righteous, with the angels, with the God who judges, with Jesus and His sacrifice, with a blood poured out. Let's go over here to chapter 12 for a moment. Just for a moment.
When you start with verse 18 and you read down through verse 21, you're at, you're at the mount that burns with fire. Judgment everywhere. Sacrifice required. Oh, by the way, even if a beast, a beast touches the mountain when it's lit up like that with God's presence, the beast dies. Everything touches the mountain has to die. And that scared them spitless. God's people. They were gathered around the mountain and they were going to hear from God and they were all excited about it until the mountain lit up. The fire burned and thunder rolled. The trumpet sounded. And all of that's going on. Here's what it, what it was. You have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them. No more do we want to hear from God. And they did that. It's in Exodus. For they could not endure the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Now listen to this. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. Moses! We have a greater than Moses now who doesn't tremble before a holy God. He is that. He trembles with fear. But he said, listen, that's not where you are. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to innumerable angels in festal gathering, to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and the spirits of the righteous made perfect and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood which speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Remember the blood of Abel? The very first son of Adam, killed by his brother Cain, and his blood poured out on the ground. What kind of yell did you get from the blood of from Abel. Vengeance! That blood cried out, something has to be done to avenge this death. Taking of a life, the life's in the blood. The killing of one of God's creatures, a man. His blood pours out and requires, demands, wants, To be avenged. That's what happens in our culture under the old way of life. Isn't it? Someone kills someone and then there is the avenger. Families do it making sure somebody's dead because they took out a loved one. You see it every single day in the news. And if you live by law, then you take the law in your hands and make it right. While only God can avenge the blood and make it right through His Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. So the blood that poured out of Him at the cross does not cry for vengeance, but cries out promising pardon and life for those who come. Isn't that good? <laughs> it is good. It is really good. I love that series of verses. I like the fact that uh, the mount is there, and the city is there, and the heavenly city is there. Angels innumerable and festal. Get you know when we find them first? Chapter 5, Revelation. Those innumerable angels are worshiping at the throne there. At the throne room that we see in Revelation 5. So we have this connection. We're talking about the same God, the same victory, the same glorious reality. The innumerable number of angels that are there. I've got to get to this. So I'm going to tell it to you and then preach it next week, okay? It's already time to go. I want us to see if we can. 
what is really happening when we gather together for worship and enter into that worship as a family together? What's going on? What is God doing? What kind of fellowship are we having? Who is there when we do that? We come and open the, the service with a song, a worship, or a something else. A song that we offer up praise to God with. Who's there? Well, you say, the church is here, and I know the Holy Spirit is here, and see that broken body left over? He was here. Not in flesh, but by and in His Spirit, He was here. Who else is here? Innumerable angels. Myriads of angels. I said, we don't see them. Well, I know. Because we gawk and try to make something out of it. But they're here. When we worship Him, they are here. We have the presence of the King. Zion's Prince with us in worship. We have God the Judge our Father in heaven, who hands that judgment off according to the creed and beyond to Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead. Spirits of the just gone home are part of the worship. I'm not making this up. I'm just telling you what's there. Part of it. Jesus, Father, Spirit, all there. One God all there. The angels, the righteous, all the ones listed in this bit of Scripture. The assembly of the firstborn enrolled in heaven. All in Christ Jesus, all enrolled in heaven. Names in heaven. Is your name in heaven? Your name in the book of life? If you're born again, it is. It's there. When we're worshiping, we're part of a people who are there, whose names are recorded. There are brothers and our sisters and their spirits there because they haven't yet come to receive new bodies, it seems. And the body didn't come with them yet. They get a new body when the glory comes. They're moving toward it in this place. To the God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. I'm going to talk about that a little bit. I want to look at it. I'm going to, I'm going to take that section where the list of things is we come to Zion. I'm going to change it up a little bit to put groups, cluster groups together. I want to give you five things that happen are relevant when we worship, just for the fun of it. It's time for us to make sure of our relationship to Him and to endeavor to come to worship as part of that body at worship, that family at worship, that people of God at worship, and to get us ready to be witnesses when people's hearts are going to be open, crying out for help going to happen I don't know when I don't know how but there will come a day when we get to bear witness to Jesus with a real need behind the behind that witness somebody's needing you some person's lost I can remember a few days when I was just starting to preach when people actually looked up the preacher after service in order to get saved when they'd been in a service, they'd been so, so dealt with by the Holy Spirit. They couldn't wait till morning. Very few times, but I remember those stories, those times. You want to be in the presence of the, law, of the Lord. You want to be here as we worship. Because He is here. No other reason to get to know Him better. Amen. Let's pray.
Father, this week will be a week guided and directed by you. We step out of here in a little bit and go our separate ways. We're going our separate ways as a community together. We're not isolated or separated. We're just doing different things in the light of the kingdom come. So help us to do that. Help us, Lord, to walk with you, to get to know you better by opening the scriptures and feeding on your word, sharing with our brother or sister or friend, talking about the text that you're reading, until it becomes food for the soul, strength for the body. Father, I pray that you would touch each one in this room today who's come with pain or difficulty or hard things going on in their life physically or in other ways. I thank you for touching our brothers and sisters in such a way they'll know you've touched them. You lift them out of a pit. You stand them on a solid rock whose name is Jesus. And I pray you do that. I pray, Lord, that every opposition to the heart and the mind Every attack on the body will be dealt with in the name of Jesus and by the power of the gospel anointing. Thank you, Lord, for touching and blessing every life, making real what we believe, making it everything you want it to be, hiding us in the revelation of your word. Thank you, Lord, for your presence and your dealings with us in a special way. Touch people as they respond, even in their minds and hearts, to you right now. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to sing. And as we sing, if you want prayer, now would be the time to come, and we'll pray with you, whatever the need.